verse 16 say, God wants to equip you. And then because that person gave you that skeptical look, say, no, you haven't quite got fully equipped yet. There's still more. Just say there's more equipping for you. You might think you know it all, but you don't. That's true for every one of us in this room, right? Some of the wives are turning to their husbands now and saying, now I'm really talking to you. Okay. (laughs) A year of equipping. God wants to equip us. God wants to perfect us. He wants to grow us. And he wants us to be a fruitful people. Even if it just means 30-fold. Now, when we read the, the, the person... Bring, well, he brings forth fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. We all go, whoo, I'm going to be the 100 fold. But maybe for some of us, we actually just got to get going with being fruitful. You know, we can't, the 100 fold is, of course, the goal. But for some of us, we actually need to be 30 fold fruitful. And we need to stop going around the same mountain of cynicism and bitterness and criticism and unforgiveness and lost dreams and rejection and all those kinds of things. Because the longer we stay going around that place, we just dig a rut for ourselves and we don't actually become fruitful. But God wants to heal us up. He wants to make us whole. He wants to restore us. He wants to perfect us so we can be a fruitful people. Amen. So 2 Timothy 2, you can turn there. 2 Timothy 2 verse 2. This is the first passage of scripture I'm going to move to. And then I'm going to move on to Ephesians 4. So if you're already at 2 Timothy 2, you can jump to Ephesians 4 and put your finger in there as well. So 2 Timothy 2 and then Ephesians 4. 2 Timothy 2. I'm going to read verse 2 of 2 Timothy 2 a lot of twos maybe it's someone's already seen it i could see shirley minute goes yeah it's 2022 (laughs) that is hilarious 2 timothy 2 verse 2 and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others let me read it one more time The things you have heard me say, this is Paul speaking to Timothy. The things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. I want to say just right off the bat that there's no such thing as too much teaching. There's no such thing as I've been going to church a little bit too long. There's no such thing as I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt and burnt the t-shirt. If God has called you to live to the age of 110... He has called you to, till the age of 110, be exposed to teaching and then to teach others. Because at no point do we get to the place where we have learned it all, got it all. We are meant to be lifelong, teachable people. So Paul says to Timothy, that which you've heard me say, in the presence of many witnesses. So there's this context, this, this group of people meeting together. Something like this on a Sunday morning, like we're meeting today. And Paul is speaking, Paul is preaching, Paul is teaching. And Timothy is hearing. And Paul's saying, that which you've heard me say, that which you've received from me, entrust to others, entrust to reliable people. I want to ask, turn to the person next to you and ask them, are you a reliable person? If they answered yes, say, this message is for you. Okay. A reliable people who will be qualified to teach others. So can you see four generations? You see Paul speaking, teaching, equipping, Timothy, and a whole bunch of witnesses, a whole group of people. And then he's saying, because he's writing the letter to Timothy, he says to Timothy, you take what you've heard me say and entrust it to other reliable people who will be able to do what? teach others. Four generations. I'm so grateful that there were reliable people in Timothy's day that he was able to teach. That were then faithful to take that and teach it to others. Because 2,000 or so years down the line, we are here today. The product of faithful men and women who have taught through the years, through the decades, through the centuries, teaching other reliable people to teach other reliable people until we get to us today. And so the, 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 the weight of responsibility lies on you and me today, not to just go out and see, you know, what we can achieve this year in our personal lives and our personal goals, not just to, you know, buy a better car, buy a bet, bigger house, um, grow our family, whatever it might be, whatever it might be, the, the, the things that we, we desire, the things that we have inside of us, and there's nothing wrong with those desires. 
But it's bigger than that. It's we, that we are part of an incredible story where God has spoken. We spoke a few weeks ago. God has spoken. The, the, he, his final word is through his son, Jesus Christ. We read that in Hebrews chapter 1. God has spoken by his son to this earth, and then he's raised up people who are teaching other people, and it's now with us. Will we be reliable people this year that are willing to be equipped so that we can equip others? Now, by saying this is a year of equipping doesn't mean last year wasn't a year of equipping. You know, four, four, three years ago we said it's a year of breakthrough. That doesn't mean there's no more breakthrough. You know, two years ago we said it's a year of growth. And then the weeds grew outside while we all sat at home. But, but if all of us were open and willing and humble enough, we would have grown. If we spent less time reading conspiracy theories and spending more time with Jesus, we would have grown. Last year was a year of breaking chains, and I believe chains are broken, but that doesn't mean chains are not going to be broken this year. We're still trusting God for breakthrough, for growth, for the breaking of chains. But what happens when we throw a phrase out like this is it just brings something back into focus for us. That we go, oh, that is true. I'm meant to be equipped. And I'm not just, I'm not, okay, cool, I've got there, I've done that, I'm now retired, I don't need to be equipped anymore. Actually, while I'm still breathing God's air and living on God's earth, I need to do God's will. Because he's put me here, and I'm completely at his mercy and by his grace. So I need to do what he's called me to do. So this year, I want to be equipped. Now maybe I feel like I've been equipped a lot over the last few years, and I'm, uh, the, the, the true test of equipping is how much you're giving away. I'm going to touch on that just now. But there is more for every single one of us. So wherever you find it yourself in today, maybe you, you're sitting here today in a chair and you say, I, would, I, I have no idea how to share my faith with somebody else. Well, this year God wants to equip you how to do that. Somebody else might be sitting here saying, well, you were talking about hearing from God. And, and when I read scripture, I just don't feel like God speaks. I need to I, help me, help me t- how to read scripture. Well, this year, if you're willing, you will be equipped in that. And for every single one of us, find ourselves in different places. So there are different areas of our lives. Maybe we, some of us are trusting God for, for, for certain things and other, others might look at you and go like, oh, you know, it doesn't appeal to them because we're all on different journeys. But God wants to equip us. So all of us here, just take a moment, just think, just think, what would it be in your mind that I would love to be equipped in this year? And equipping, it means doesn't, I've now got, it's not, equipping doesn't mean I'm sitting in a classroom and someone's teaching me in front there and then I write an exam and awesome, I'm done. I've got an A, a B, a C or an F or whatever we're allowed to get in South Africa nowadays. That was, I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. I apologize. And we all, I take it back. I retract that statement. We, we, what, what I'm trying to say is we're not, we're not, it's not like sitting in a classroom Equipping in the kingdom looks like fruitfulness. I know I'm equipped if I'm bearing fruit in my life. That means that there are those that I'm equipping, I'm giving to, I'm giving out to. There are others who are growing because I'm growing. And my, so my sphere of influence grows because I'm growing. Amen? Okay. So just take a moment to think. What is it that I would like to be equipped? And maybe you've got a whole list. But just, just think for a second or two. I'd love to... Hear God's voice clearer. I'd love to grow in my faith. I'd love to lay my hands on the sick and watch them recover, which is what God commands us as Christians. And you'll lay your hands on the sick and they'll recover. So I want to, I want to, that can't just be true for some superhuman Christian. That needs to be true for me too. Maybe it's, I want to be equipped in walking in peace. I want to be equipped in, there's so many things. What is it that you are wanting to be equipped in? I encourage you, what it is that's just popped into your mind right now, what you've been thinking about, go write it down. Go put it in your diary. Go put it in your phone. Put it somewhere where you will find it. One of the things I find if you put it into the phone is that you then don't find it. Have you ever tried to find a photo you took with your phone? Right? And phones are getting cleverer and cleverer. They're trying to help us now to keep all our lives together from a memories and photos point of view. But you still lose things. And uh, I have a notes app on my phone, as I'm sure most of you do. And uh, it's ridiculous. It's just ridiculous, like trying to find stuff in a notes app. Fortunately, there is the search option. And there is also Google if you've lost your mind. But um, <laughs> the, the end of the day... The things that are important. Now I'm, now I'm like, instead of typing in small letters with one capital letter at the beginning like you learn in school, I now type everything in big capital letters like I need to remember that. But where do you go from there? 
once everything's in big capital letters, well, then you've got to enlarge the font. I mean, what do you do? Where do you go eventually? Just stuff just gets lost. I get before God and say, well, God, what are the, there are a there are hundred things. So what are the two or three things? Or what is the one thing? And then write it down, stick it on the door of your fridge, put it on the mirror, in, you know, put it on the door of the bathroom, put it in, on your mirror when you wake up in the morning, wherever, but, but, but put it somewhere, put it in your car. Um, write out little pieces of paper and put them in your pockets. And you, when you reach to pull out your cell phone or whatever, you pull out a piece of paper and it reminds you, oh, I'm meant to be a witness of Jesus today, so I should stop shouting at that person right now. You know, just th- little things like that, okay? But the point being is that we need to, we need to if there's no good in making a decision now, I want to be equipped in something. If we're not going to be deliberate, we're going to get to the end of the year and we won't be equipped in that area. Amen? Okay, so keep that in mind. So again, I want to say there's no such thing as too much teaching. Anyone who says, I've heard this all before, or why are we hearing this again, has lost sight of the gospel and lost sight of the clear command of Jesus to go and make disciples of all nations. The clear mandate of scripture, we sang about it earlier, on earth as it is in heaven. We're crying out for heaven to come to earth. Too many people are just waiting for, I need to be rescued when Jesus is actually saying, I'm, I've given you something to pray and that prayer is on earth as it is in heaven. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then he says, I'm going to use you. I'm going to use, I'm going to use each and every one of us in this room. So he's given us a clear mandate on earth as it is in heaven. He's given us a clear mandate. Go and make disciples of all nations. When do we stop doing that? When he says so. Not when you and I decide so. He says, you will be my witnesses. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit falls upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. All of us are called to play a role in every single one of those areas. And maybe we don't get to the ends of the earth, but we're still called to play a role in that area. Nowadays, you can get to the ends of the earth through, what's, through, through the ends of the earth, through WhatsApp, through Zoom, through Facebook, through email, through many other things and areas and avenues. A phone call. A friend, a friend is actually in this room today. said he received a phone call. I can't remember the country, some weird country. I think it was Pakistan. It's not that weird. They play cricket, so they're not that weird compared to us. Um, but I think it was from Pakistan. But some random guy from Pakistan somehow got his contact details and emailed him or WhatsApp him or sms him or something. And uh, he was having a conversation. We were chatting about this. And, and I don't know what God wants to do with that. All I know is that it's that easy for God to connect someone in South Africa with someone in Pakistan. And so we've got to be open. We've got to be, I'm, but I'm called to be a witness. And so I, God has got something for me. Now, if you're 90 years old, and you're still breathing, God has got, you could still be, let's just, just for, I, I said 90 years, because no one here is 90 and above, um, so that means it covers all of us, so I'm safe, um, you could, I remember hearing years ago, um, a, a man saying that God can put you in contact with somebody, and that person could become the next Rana Bonki in their country, and that could, you know, you could be 90 years old, and somehow through some coincidence, you come in contact with somebody, you lead them to the Lord, and that person goes and leads India to Jesus. None of us here are done until we breathe our last breath, until Jesus returns. So turn with me to Ephesians 4. E- 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 Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. Yeah. If somebody's able to maybe... Tim, maybe you can just grab me one of those waters over there. Thank you. Okay, we're going to read, well, we're kind of going to read around in Ephesians 4, but, um, well, let's just start at the beginning of Ephesians 4. It says, I therefore, prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And that's what we've just been talking about for the last few minutes. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Thank you. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all, who is over all and through all and in all. In a world where churches seem to be going in so many different directions with so, with so much division, this is still God's heart, it's still God's call. His desire is still that we will walk one calling, one hope, one faith. And he goes on to say, we're going to read about it just now, that we will be built up into Jesus Christ, a mature man. That is God's ultimate goal for us as the church of Jesus Christ around the world that he is building, is that we will be built up into Jesus Christ. 
And God is not somebody who says something and then goes, oh, I failed. I wasn't able to achieve it. God is able to do what he says he will do. You and I just need to be willing to submit to it. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father over all. And uh, this has challenged me sometimes when I think about certain Christians and, and uh, not in the building or uh, even on the South Coast, just generally, you know, because it's very easy when you jump on the internet or wherever, it's very easy to make value judgments about certain church movements. I keep reminding myself every time that they're on the same side as I am. They are, they are the same side as me. You know, and I'm just grateful I'm not as famous as them because then we'd be just as um, attacked, persecuted, called out as they are. Um, it's, it's a tough thing to be. I mean, have you, has anyone watched cricket recently? Anyone watched rugby? I mean, we all have an opinion just on our South African team and how they should be playing, what they should be doing, right? So, you know, if that was you, they would have an opinion on you too. So, this could be dangerous to leave the water there, but we'll see. At one point, I'm going to do that, and then, anyway. Um, so, I, God, God is, it's been something that, that I've l- learning and growing in, is to guard my heart towards other church movements and other churches. Because when I listen to people preach, and I hear, I don't, if I'm, if I'm going to be jealous, first of all, or if I'm going to be like, well, you know, but they do that, or did you hear what that person said? then I'm going to immediately put a block inside of me that shuts myself down from hearing. And they've got something that they carry that God wants me to have. And because of dishonor, I'm unable to receive. And there are too many Christians, unfortunately, through dishonor that have blocked themselves off from people. We have an incredible privilege nowadays of being able to hear voices from all over the world. And I'm not saying that we should be running after all those voices. I was chatting to somebody the other day, last night I think it was, she's talking about watching TV and and things, and and that is great. But that person said to me, they said, but it doesn't take the place of church like this. The important thing for all of us is that we're always in a local context where there are people that we actually rub shoulders with. Because Stephen Furtick doesn't know your name. As great a preacher as he is. Okay. So I've learned to learn from people but to make sure that I'm not, that's not what I'm just pulling from all the time. But I've got a personal walk with God that is outworked in local community. And then I've got friends that I can actually sit and have coffee with that I can actually call me out and things. And we actually can work through things together. That's real life, right? Um, but at the same time, I don't dishonor the voices that are speaking around the world. Because ultimately, God has called us all to come together in unity. That's the goal. That we all become a this perfect bride, this, this bride without spot or blemish. So as much as I want to sometimes maybe call somebody out on something, I recognize that, hang on, I've got to get rid of the log of my own eye first. Okay. Um, we've got to learn to honor people around us. Jesus said, if they're not against us, they're for us. Paul even goes so far as to say, that's Jesus. That's why, Je- that's why the Son of God is walking on this earth and his disciples got irritated. Who are those people? They're busy preaching and busy doing things. Who who do they think they are? Jesus is like, well, if they're not against us, they're for us. You're the son of God. Well, you should know exactly what's going on over there. And Jesus taught us and gave an illustration to us, an example to us. Actually, hang on, you don't need to know what's going on. If they're they're not against us, they're for us. And then Paul says, they are are those guys who preach for dishonest gain or whatever. But at the end of the day, Jesus is preached. Don't you love that? That just just is like... A hammer below to our opinions. Okay, so we are in Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to read verse 7. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of... I'm going to have to stop moving faster. Okay, so I'm going to talk much faster now. So just, you know on that WhatsApp when you go 1.5 times, two, one, 2 times, just do that in your brain. Ching, ching. Okay, here we go. You ready? No, just joking. Okay, anyway, we'll just tell the clock to stop. Okay, grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And it goes on to say, he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth. So Jesus went down into death. So he, he, he is in all and through all in every area of life, in the, in the realm of death, the depths of the earth in the realm of this earth and in the heavens. Jesus is through all and in all. So he's, he's, it, this is a demonstration that he is Lord of it all. And in that ascending, he, he, he led forth a host of captives. Um, and then he gave gifts to men. I love this verse because if you look at 
um, Isaiah, uh, not Isaiah, sorry, Psalm 68, which I'm going to quickly just turn there. But I don't have enough place markers. Let's do that. Awkward moment while you're sitting waiting for me to find a scripture. Listen to the mic. Psalm 68 and verse 18. You ascended on high, David says, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell there. I love this. So David's prophesying of Jesus Christ many, many hundreds of years before Jesus comes. And then Paul uses that to say, This is that. So this is that Paul confirms what David says there is what happens with Jesus when he ascends into the heavens. And he ascends leading forth a host of captives. And then um, we won't talk about that today because we don't have time. But it says there in Psalm 68, it says, receiving gifts among men. The way Paul says it, receiving gifts among men, the way Paul says it is he gave gifts to men. What I love about this, we say this over and over and over again, is that we have to be able to see the Old Testament through the eyes of the New Testament. Everything that we read through Scripture, everything was given to us for our instruction, but we've got to, it's got to be aimed through the lens of the cross. So Paul takes a Scripture where it says Jesus received gifts from men, and he says what it actually means in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, that verse through the lens of the cross is he gave gifts to men. Isn't that beautiful? Like you could say, well, Paul, you misquoting scripture. No, Paul actually was divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit to misquote that verse. Instead of it being Jesus received gifts, Jesus gives gifts. And he's giving gifts to us as a church, as a people. I just wanted to point that out because I thought that was fun. Don't you think that was fun? So, and he gave gifts to men. So what are those gifts? So let's look at verse 11. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. And here is the verse that I want us to not forget, if we forget everything else, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That is God's vision for you and for me. The vision that Jesus has as he is building his church is that we will be this kind of church, bride, army, building, the different pictures in, the, in scripture that tell us about who we are as a church. The, the, what, what he is aiming for is that we will be a mature, to mature manhood, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That as a church, one church being built around the world, we will look like the fullness of Jesus to the nations. That's his goal. That's his vision. And he's not going to stop until he achieves that. You and I get a chance in our generation and in our lifetime to choose, as Tim was saying earlier, we get a choice to be a part of that or not to be a part of that. I choose this year to be equipped. I want to be a part of that. I want to grow. I want to be equipped. So verse Verse uh, 12 says, to equip the saints. Some of your translations will say to perfect the saints. Um, and let me just point something else out here. Um, and I apologize if you are a King James Version fan. It's a great translation. Okay? It was written many, many hundreds of years ago. Um, but it's great. There's, there's nothing wrong with the King James, just as there's nothing wrong with many other translations. Okay? Um, but the, uh, the King James Version is a little bit unhelpful in this particular verse. Because... If you look at history, in church history, you'll see often, who is it that does the work of the ministry? Over, over history. Yeah, exactly. And I shouldn't have been wearing a loose shirt today. And I should have, you know, I should have been looking dressed a little bit different because a priest dress is a bit different. And, um, and of course, it's the, the pastor, the, the, the clergyman, the, the clerical people who do the work of the ministry. And everyone else just comes and sits. And listens and goes home. That's been, that has had a, a large portion of history has had that kind of way of thinking. Not, not, let's not, let's not awful our situation. There have been many churches that haven't done that. Um, but there has been that kind of trend through history, right? Um, but through history also, God has been, there have been people who have recognized actually we're all the priesthood. We're all the priesthood. We're just going to read about now. So what the King James does, and this is why I say it's a little bit unhelpful, because there's no comma in Greek and Hebrew and all that. It's not, not like an actual comma. But the King James puts a comma in its translation. It says, to equip the saints, comma, for the work of the ministry, comma, for the building up of the body of Christ. So that means there's three things. 
it means that the gifts that Jesus gave to men and women, us, is they gave them to us to equip the saints, comma, to do the work of the ministry, comma, and then what's the last one? The building up of the body of Christ. But this is what I love about pretty much every other translation is they get this right. They don't put a comma there. The comma's gone. I know it's a small thing, but when you, where you put the comma, where you put the full stop changes how you read things and how you say things. And unfortunately, the way people have read this sometimes is it's the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, the clerical people. They do all the work. The rest of us just as, what did, what did someone say? God, you keep them humble. We'll keep them poor. And that's not, that, that, that is not at all God's heart. It's not like, well, okay, the person who's the pastor is the servant of all. So yes, I am a servant to you all, but we're all servants to each other. That's the difference, right? We're all servants to each other. Um, okay, so th this, this uh, obviously without the comma helps us to see that actually all of us are called to do the work of the ministry. Do you see the difference? All of us are called to do the work of the ministry, to equip the saints for the work of of ministry. So 1 Peter 2 verse 9, which I'll just read quickly. One Peter 2 verse 9. In case you're not sure, it says this You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. A royal priesthood. I've had people arrive here at the church and say, I want to speak to the priest. It's happened. True story. Well, that's all of us. That's all of us. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're a priest. Now, it doesn't mean we walk around calling ourselves priests, but it just helps to break something in our brains. You know how it is when um, you go into a certain environment and then you've got to have the priest do the prayer. Are there any other Christians in that room? Highly likely, but for some reason we single out the one priest, not all the other priests. The priest needs to pray for the food. Actually, any one of us can pray for the food. People sometimes come to me and they expect a special prayer because David's the one praying for them. But you know what? Every single one of us in this room can pray a special prayer. Every single one of us. Because there's nothing special about me. I have a certain function and a certain calling. Every single one of us has a function and a calling. Every single one of us can pray powerful prayers like Elijah, who was a man just like one of us. That's, it's a good thing just to break this down in our heads. That's important. We've got to break this down in our heads. Otherwise, we will still, in, in a very subtle way, still build a clergy and separate the clergy from the rest of us. We've got to recognize that we're all a royal priesthood. And we've got to break this thing down. I'm not saying that means we just dishonor or whatever. We honor each other. We honor each other in the calling God has given each and every one of us. But every single one of us get to be honored. Because every single one of us carries something. Amen? Okay. Everyone and anyone can be equipped. In Acts chapter 2, it says, And the Holy Spirit was poured out. Holy Spirit was poured out on my maidservants and my, my servants and my maidservants, on children, on old people, on male and female. It, it kind of covers the whole spectrum of those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. Every single one of us, if we've said yes to Jesus, can be equipped and we've got a ministry to do. Amen? When someone comes and says, oh, you know, I, I feel like God's got this special calling in my life. I'd say that's awesome because God does. And he's got a special calling on the other person and the other person and the other person. Every single one of us has a special calling on our lives from him for what he wants us to do. Okay, we're all good? Okay. Attitudes and actions of a person who can be equipped. So here's, the, here's where it gets a little bit crunchy is that not everyone can be equipped. It's windy today. Not everyone can be equipped. Now, what I mean by that? I said can, not may. Some people, in the way they built their lives, have blocked themselves from being equipped. Jesus talks about the seed and the sower, and the guy goes out to sow seed. Not everyone produces fruit. Some get choked by the worries of this earth. Some, it doesn't even get that far. There's, there's these, these three different types of seed before you even get to the seed that actually produces fruit. And then even with those who produce fruit, there's different types of fruit or different levels or different quantities of fruit. So it's not the same for everybody. 
We've got to realize and recognize this, that every single one of us has to be very deliberate to have an attitude within us that I want to be equipped and then to position ourselves to be equipped. And those are the two things I'm going to talk about now. An attitude and action and to position ourselves well. So not everyone can be equipped, but if we carry these attitudes, we can. And this is where we've got to say, okay, God, help me in this area. If I find this area is a block in my life, I need to deal with it because I want to be available to be equipped. I, I can't tell you over the 16 years that I've been here back in this church, how many times I've had people say to me, I want to do great things for God, and then they just fall by the wayside. If every person who told me they want to do great things for God in their different ways that they say it, all stuck out the journey and were willing to be equipped and were willing to grow and it, who wasn't, weren't as interested in the spotlight, the limelight, and the microphone as much as they were in being fruitful, this church would look very different now, 16 years later, than it does at the moment if every person who came to me followed the, the, walked through the journey. There's, there is a discipleship journey that we get to go on. And it, it's not a course. It's not go and do a discipleship course, awesome, you're now a disciple. No, the disciples are the ones that put their faith in Jesus Christ. They're called disciples. Every single one of us is a disciple. Every single one of us needs to be discipled. And every single one of us needs to go on and make disciples. I'm not going to go through a course, tick a box and say, I'm now a disciple. I've now, become a, I've now been discipled. It, it's, it's impossible. It's about life. I mean, if we're going to do a course and we must do it Jesus' way, we all quit everything. We quit our jobs. We quit everything. We live by faith, like Tim said, and we... <laughs> I can say that because it's Tim. So we all quit everything. We all move here. We build some extra bathrooms at the back, maybe a couple of donkey toilet type shower type vibe thingies. And Siri's talking to me. And so we... We, we live here for three years, and we then do our discipleship program. Now, for some of you, actually, like, that sounds really, really awesome. <laughs> but actually, there is life to be lived in the process, in our homes, in our spaces, in our marriages, with our kids, in our singleness, in all the different spaces we find ourselves. But it's always an attitude of discipleship. Always. When I go to life group, I'm going to be discipled. When I come to church on a Sunday morning, I'm going to be discipled. When I'm heading out into the community today, I'm trusting God that I'm going to f disciple someone. Always. Amen? So the attitudes and actions of a person who can be equipped. So first of all, to say this, to be equipped, we have to be able to receive instruction. Instruction. There has to be an inner structure. Instruction. An inner structure inside of us that can receive things. Has anyone tried to pour water into a bucket that has a serious crack on the bottom? It's irritating, isn't it? I remember once I told the story, I'm sure I have. Sonia and I, when we first got married, I think in our first year of marriage, we were here at youth that night, um, but there was somebody cleaning our house at that particular day, and we had, the water went off. Unusual, right? And so, so they'd opened the tap, and there'd been no water. They didn't close the tap, and they'd already put the plug in to run the water to do the dishes. And uh, this is a very long story. And so we came here to youth. We went home, got home like 11 p.m. And Sonia meets me at the door because we came in two different vehicles. She met me at the door and she said, she, she just got home before me. She says, David, if we can laugh about it later, we can laugh about it now. And I was like, what's happened? And I walked into the house and there was just water everywhere. Everywhere. So we spent the next few hours till about 2 o'clock in the morning cleaning and all that. The one moment where I did get a little bit frustrated, just a little bit, was when I was putting water into this, what I thought was, what is a rubbish bin, but I thought it was sealed at the bottom. And then I was putting water in, putting water in, putting water in. And then I picked it up and it's just, and I was like, oh. Now that's a picture of a person who is, doesn't have an inner structure that's able to contain what God wants to place inside of us. So right off the bat, we have to, we have to say, <laughs> I need to have an inner structure. Proverbs um, 4, verse 13, uh, 3, sorry, verse 13 says, Blessed is the one who finds wisdom, the one who gets understanding. Understanding is the ability to receive instruction. And we've got to build within us this inner structure. And here are some ways to do that. Number one, we need to be a people of great humility. Now, I actually didn't want to say great. We need to be a people of humility. Because there's no such thing as great humility or greater humility. It's, you're either humble or you're not. It's humility. You need to be a people of humility. 
That means it's not that I think of myself. I'm going to say this right. It's not that I think less of myself. It's that I think of myself less. It's not so much about my needs, my desires, my stuff. It's about walking in. It's submitted to him, surrendered to him, and focused on his needs and the needs of others. And in that process, my needs get met. But it's not about me. It's not about, I'm, it's not, it's not, I'm not the center of my world. Jesus is the center of my world. Humility. Number two, we need to develop favor. This is the attitudes and actions of a person who is able to be equipped. We need to develop favor. We need to become someone that people want to be around. Don't just say, well, everybody else needs to change. Maybe sometimes we're the ones that have to change. Because where we go, there we are again. And if we find certain patterns following us year after year after year, the question has to then be, it can't be the whole planet that's wrong. It's got to be something that's got to be adjusted inside of me. And when I find myself in another space, and it's the same problem, and I move from this job to that job to that job, and I've always got problems in my job, then I have to ask myself the question, what is going on inside of me that needs to change? Because God's heart is that we become a people who attract favor. Yes, we also attract persecution, as someone will very quickly remind me. But as it's also true as attracting persecution, we also attract favor. We get the full package. Some people just attract persecution, and that's a problem. We get to attract both Jesus. Luke 2 tells us about Jesus. He grew in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man. Even Jesus needed to grow in favor. That's Luke 2.52. Even Jesus needed to grow in favor. Become a person who attracts the favor of people around you. Don't deliberately be otherwise just because you can. Don't deliberately always have to be the person who's always got to say something different. Let's, let's learn how to live at peace with each other. Let's learn how to grow in favor with each other. If we are a people who, who know how to attract favor, we will be able to hear and to learn and to listen. Amen? Thirdly, passion and stamina. Another word that I could use for this is perseverance. We've got to be willing to, this is a long journey, not just a two or three day thing. Passion and stamina. I need to be passionate. There needs to be a passion that grows up inside of me for the things of God, to grow into the fullness of God, to become like Elijah, a man just like every one of, any one of us, who was a very passionate man. I need passionate passion to grow inside of me. I need stamina to grow, uh, grow inside of me. Even, even Elijah ran out of stamina at some point, and God had to sort him out, and then God had to say to him, no, you're not the only one. There are others. There are others. You're not woe is me, pitiful me. No, there are others. It, the word really is perseverance. Gird yourself up and get going. Get on the journey. You might say, well, I've wasted so much time already. Well, start today. Because a year from now, think how far you could be. Amen? And then fourthly, so humility, favor, passion and stamina. And then fourthly, grace. And just briefly, all I want to say is this. Walk in the grace of God and give grace to others. Give the same grace to others as you would like to receive in your worst moment. Think about your worst moment and the grace you would like to receive in that moment and give that kind of grace to those around you because grace attracts the power of the Holy Spirit. Grace attracts the power of the Holy Spirit. Grace. 